So now we're going to move from average rate of change to instantaneous rate of change. So we're going to do is move away from secant lines and get into tangent lines. So we're going to tie it back to this visual here, which is a graph of x squared. So just to go over what we've been talking about in terms of average rate of change, we're looking at our function from one x value to another x value. And that average rate of change found the slope of the secant line between those two coordinates. So for example, if I wanted the average rate of change on x squared from x equals 1 to x equals 2, we would look at the slope of the tangent line between those two points, which in this case would be a slope of 3. So that's just a little example there of how we're seeing that average rate of change as the slope of the secant line. So as that interval shrinks, so like between 1 to 2, instead of thinking of it as 1 to 2, what we could do is call it 1 to 1 plus h as h starts getting closer and closer to 0, but not equal to 0 because that won't be useful, but we want to be as close as we can be to 1 there. So as that interval shrinks, the secant lines approach a line that is called the tangent line. So let's get a visual for that. So we were going from 1 to 2. What I could say is, well, what if we just move to 1.5? Well, then I would have the slope of the secant line between those two points. It's like, well, if I want to be even closer to 1, what about 1.25? What about 1.1? What about as I get closer and closer and, and as zoomed in as I could get, if I want to know the average rate of change right here, when x is equal to 1, I want to be as close as I can possibly be in order to look at that slope of the secant line. But as I get closer and closer, what we end up calling it is the tangent line. So the tangent line is where we have a point on our graph. It's going to be the slope that goes through that exact coordinate and only that coordinate while matching the rate of change of our graph. So what I would do is I would take a line and I would try to match it up as closely as I could with our graph here. And this isn't going to be perfect and at this point in the term we're just estimating as best we can. But what I would be doing is just kind of moving this line around or if you have a ruler just kind of trying to line up that ruler with your graph so it just touches right there. Just at that point while matching the rate of change of our graph at that point. Then what I'm going to do is just stretch this out. Oh, but don't go away. Okay. That's not too bad. But I'm just going to do this. Okay. There we go. So this right here is the tangent line because it goes through that coordinate that we're interested in our graph in terms of the slope is that if we zoomed in we'd want those basically to line up so that if we could see something kind of linear on our function there that that line is matching up with the slope so this right here is called our tangent line because it hits that one coordinate on our graph and matching that rate of change as close as we can at that exact coordinate. So that's our tangent line. The slope of the tangent line to the graph at a point measures the rate of change of the function at that exact point. Um, this is also called the instantaneous rate of change. At this point in our course, we're just going to estimate visually. Um, that's the best we can do right now. And then from there, we'll get this is where the calculus comes in. It'll calculate it for us. So what we do is we look as that interval gets smaller and smaller with the average rate of change. Like I wrote up here, if we have that interval from 1 to 1 plus h, it's as h approaches 0. Now, some terminology. These all represent the same thing. So instantaneous rate of change is the same as the slope of the tangent line. And we haven't talked about this yet, but eventually this is going to match with derivative at a point. Those are all doing the same thing. Okay, so for our graph up above, just for example, so our instantaneous rate of change, 
what we have is just one x value. So we're looking for the instantaneous rate of change of our function at x equals at x1, and that's the slope of the tangent line at that point x1, y1. So we're only graphing one point with these. And for example, with our graph up above, if we took that instantaneous rate of change at x equals 1, it's going to be a 2. And what we could see is that is true with the slope of the tangent line that we're getting out there. Okay, so from there, let's go ahead and look at some examples and how we can estimate this. So our first example here, we have a rock is shot upward with a velocity of 80 meters per second. The height after t seconds is given by h of t there. Find the average velocity over the given time intervals and predict the instantaneous velocity after 30 seconds. So what we can see here is our intervals. So we go from 30 to 31, 30 to 30.5. So we're getting this idea of those increments getting smaller and smaller. So we're trying to creep as close as we can to 30. And with that, what we can do is analyze how are these average rates of change moving because that will tell us about our instantaneous rate of change. Now with problems involving distance and time, so if you have a function that gives you information in terms of distance and time, this instantaneous rate of change relates to velocity. It's like how we work with um, slope because it's our change in output over change in input. So it's how we're changing distance over how we change in time. So it's like miles per hour, kilometers per second, which describes the velocity. So that's what we're seeing here in terms of our notation. So I want to analyze our average rate of change. So what I want to do is take our output for our function for that second point minus the output for our function for that first point all over the difference in those two points. But what I'm going to do is that first point is always going to be 30. So I'm just going to replace what I wrote as t1 with 30. And I'm going to go back to Desmos and have it do the calculating for me. So let me show you how you can set this up to get a table of values nice and quick. So our function f of x is going to be 80 plus 48x minus 0.5x squared. And then I want my table to look from 30. So all of them are going to use 30. So I just want these values of 31, 30.5, 30.1, 30 30.001. And need to edit that. Okay. And then our function that we're working with isn't just function output. What we're doing here is looking for this average rate of change. So I'm going to put my division and I'll have the output of our function at that given point, which is x1 minus the output of 30 over that x value minus 30. So what you see here is we have 17.5 for our first one. Then it was 17.75 for the second one. Then a 17.95. Then a 17.995. So what we could see is how those are approaching that instantaneous velocity. It looks like that's going to be 18. As we make our interval smaller and smaller between 30 and a second number, we're seeing an average rate of change of 18. So that would be predicting our instantaneous velocity after 30 seconds. So what we could say is it is predicted. We didn't calculate it. We want to be a little careful, but it should be true that the instantaneous velocity I think I left out some letters there. Okay, instantaneous velocity after 30 seconds is 
is 18 and it was meters per second. So that gives us a glimpse of how fast is the rock traveling after 30 seconds and exactly that moment of time. Whereas these first ones are telling us about an interval, so like that 17.5, that would be what's happening between 30 seconds and 31 seconds. And then between 30 and 30.5, the average rate of change was 17.75 meters per second. So all of those dealt with an interval of two time increments, or rather one time increment, whereas instantaneous velocity is at a single moment in time. Okay, let's go back to a visual and how to find these average, average rates of change and instantaneous rates of change given a graph. We also have the function up above, so we could use um, a calculator to help out here by making tables, but let's say we just had to use a visual medium, medium to do it. So describe the behavior of the ball on the increment of 0 to 1. So if we start at 0 and go to positive 1, what we're seeing is that the height is increasing. So we're going upward. So let's say, let's just say we're going upward over that increment. And then from t equals 1 to t equals 3, it starts going down. So it's going down. So this is the idea that they're throwing a ball into the air. So we throw it upward, it goes up, 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 and then it reaches a maximum height right there at t equals 1. And then from there it starts going down until it hits the ground at, it looks like, three seconds, it's going to be back down on the ground. So what occurs at the instant t equals 1? It's not moving. At that very moment in time, it's neither increasing nor decreasing. So it's just not moving at that spot. So let's estimate the instantaneous velocity at 0.5 at 1 and at 2. And starting off right now, what I could see is that at t equals 0.5, that instantaneous velocity is going to be positive because it's going upward. I can already estimate that instantaneous velocity at the point t equals 1 based on what we said before, that it's not moving. That would mean I expect that velocity to be 0. But I'll also show that with the tangent line. And then at t equals 2, what I could see is since we're going downward, we're going to have a negative instantaneous velocity. Okay, so t equals 0.5. If I want to estimate our instantaneous velocity, what I would be doing is trying to graph the tangent line. So what I would be doing is taking a line and trying to match it up so that it goes through that point, but also matching our rate of change right there. And with that, it just takes some practice and estimating. And then I just want to stretch my line out far enough so that I could measure the slope. So maybe something like this. Again, we're just estimating as best we can. But I want to go from that coordinate. And then I just want to go one unit away. So how about a second point out over here? And I just want to map what is my slope between those two points. So let's see, we have increments of four here. So we went down eight units, and then to the left, 0.5. So what I'm gonna do for slope there is estimate it as a negative eight over negative 0.5, which ends up being positive, which is exactly what we were expecting and that would be 16 and this would be feet per second and this is an estimate so i should probably should put about 16 feet per second so that's how we're estimating instantaneous velocity at this point in the course we just make that tangent line and try to estimate that slope as best we can now at t equals one when we do this 
because of that point and it's being a maximum, what's going to happen is we are graphing a horizontal line. It's going to be exactly flat there. And when we do that, we have a slope of zero. So when we reach these peaks, and um, if it was opening upward, if it heats, I always call them the valleys, if we hit those minimum values and maximum values, we're going to have these tangent lines that are horizontal. So with that, the slope of the tangent line is going to be zero. So that's the visual for why we get zero out for t equals one. Okay, and then at t equals 2, what I'm going to do is the same thing of just trying as best I can to match up the slope there. That's not too bad. And then just extending it far enough so I can get a nice clear second coordinate. How about there? That's close enough. So, and this is going 0.5, and then we went down... 4, 8, 12, and how about, let's say 2 more, so 14. So let's call that down 14 over 0.5, which would be a negative 28. And that would be about negative 28 feet per second. Okay, so those are our tangent lines and how we can use them to estimate our instantaneous rate of change.